Good evening, Bill. Good evening, Sandy. Wow, we're all formal today. Yep. Wow, I haven't seen you for a long time. <clears throat> Two whole weeks. Mm -hmm. How has our viewership survived? <sighs> Meagerly, <laughs> as usual. <laughs> anyway, tonight, speaking of seeing yeah. thinly veiled, a conversation with you, Bill Wadman. That's me, Bill Wadman. I'm in rare form this evening, as you can tell. Yes, I've already had the full throttle experience of yeah. <laughs> this afternoon. How many Coca-Colas have you drunk? Uh, just one and a half. Okay. No, just one. Okay. I guess I'm just excited to be here. So thinly veiled. Yep. Actually came about because of painting number two this evening. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but... To me, thinly veiled implies already through the words something that is maybe mysterious, yet um, at once subtle and unsubtle. It has a kind of duality, thinly veiled. Um, something that's thinly veiled is partially hidden. I, now, I, we haven't gotten to the first slide yet, but why is it that if the second slide is the one that inspired you on this did you find the need to put an earlier slide in um because when we look at anything from what we think of as like western great masters we often find that their influence is so powerful that it reaches into actually quite a lot of what we would talk about anyway and i know that this painting or indeed this artist rather did inspire the second artist who we will come to. But I mean, this is Raphael. And this one actually has an actual veil. Yes. Thin or otherwise. Yes. Um, uh, but she's also clutching her chest. It's weird. I, I don't know this image. So sorry to interrupt. You were going to say something. It's OK, but um, I do want to say that Raphael was known for being a hit with the ladies. <laughs> um, okay. But he had one true love, and it was this woman. Um, and she was his Roman mistress. He saw her apparently from a distance, bathing her feet in the river in the Tiber. And um, how I met my wife. <laughs> <laughs> but there's something about her. When he spoke to her, he discovered some quote somewhere that. Her mind was as beautiful as her body. And though he was betrothed to somebody else, which is very awkward because the betrothal was, his fiance was actually the daughter of his greatest patron. Um, nonetheless, he big loved- Big no-no. Yeah, big no-no. He loved this woman to the end. Um, and she appears um, in a couple of his paintings as his muse. Uh, and yeah, I, I wanted to put it here because the quality of the paint itself is something that, you know, you and I often talk about meanings and our hidden agendas all over the place, which is kind of ironic now talking about thinly veiled that I want to simply talk at the moment about the way the paint is, the way the color is, the way yeah, the, 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 the gold trim on the stuff in the foreground is nuts. Well, Raphael was, um, you know, I mean, he was celebrated in his lifetime, very short life. All that amorousness earned him the fever that killed him, age 37, 38. Um, but he had a real softness, I think. Uh, perhaps see it in his painting. Um, something about a, a gentleness, finding gentleness. Uh, can, I, can I ask you a, a slightly awkward question about this painting? Not an awkward question, but the, the, the way that the fabric veil sits on her right shoulder, the far shoulder, mm. um, does that feel unnatural to you, the way it curves there? Mm, it's maybe a bit far out. Yeah, right? Isn't it, do you, okay, let me ask you a question. I mean, obviously not all painters are perfect. Painters are not photographers, you know, unless they're Vermeer. Um, 
does if you see issues of perspective or size you know between objects and a painting and that kind of stuff does it immediately take you out of it does that make sense yeah but no okay yeah i mean even there's a there's a caravaggio it uh at the met here where the perspective isn't quite right because you can tell he he you know did it in chunks and it's like oh he i wonder if i wonder if he i wonder if Raphael or i wonder if caravaggio in that case like at, when they finished said ah, i missed on this one let me go to the next one or if they think that they you know I, I wonder if it was ever a thing for them well i think in this painting in particular this would have been painted with enormous tenderness yeah um well i mean certainly the face and everything else is nearly perfect for what it needs to be yes and margarita lutti i mean she was a renowned beauty uh he did sort of uh, not make her famous but she became much better known through Raphael. she was a baker's daughter she's called a uh, la fornarina for that reason um and you know i mean he he got into scuffles about her he was sort of passionately in love with her mm. i mean his his betrothed, his fiance is the person who's actually buried beside him. Uh, but yeah, not her. This is the woman who he loved until he died. Her um, eyes are almost as big as yours. <laughs> Bill. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. What were you going to say? I have no idea. That's just the most off putting comment. <laughs> I didn't mean to offend you. Anyway. They're they're both good. So the other thing I want to say about Raphael, one, I mean, lots of uh, lovely evidence about him in art history. You can find out a lot about him. It's quite well documented. He was also, you know, height of Renaissance. He was despised by all accounts <laughs> and by Michelangelo. Um, and I mean, they were contemporaries. Yeah. I, I know that Michelangelo now has the greater fame. And who am I to suggest that Raphael is the contender to that throne? But Raphael's painting does have this, I said earlier, this word gentleness, it has this quality. He was also, by the way, you talked earlier about perspective and how sometimes if someone gets that a bit wrong, it can put us off. Yeah. He was a master of painting perspective. Um, yeah. And also something he did with such incredible visual eloquence, and we don't see it in this painting because it's of a, a single sitter, is he painted uh, couples or pairs of people uh, in a really very bizarre way, which was very beautiful. Um, and anyway, I do want to move on because the, the reason why I had this image anyway, apart from the fact it fitted with the title and it's a very beautiful painting, is because Raphael really inspired Christian Shard. How do you how do you know that? Did you read something? Yes, yeah, so I know that in in Shard's kind of repertoire of things that would have have got under his skin, um, Raphael is there. And actually, in this painting, which I hadn't seen before until very recently, I was in London at Tate Modern and I saw it on the wall. Um, they've reshuffled their collections and. So things that haven't been on display before were there, or things have been moved. It was an unfamiliar layout to me. So that's good because it means I pay more attention usually. Um, or most people pay more attention, I think, in, in that situation. And I stood for ages at this painting. I found something about it very bizarre, um, but immediately it made me think actually, uh, not of the veil by Raphael, but another painting by Raphael, which is, the Friends, which is a portrait of two men. One is him, one is her, his, his closest male friend. And the position of the two characters in that painting are very similar to this. Anyway, this is a self-portrait. And if, if anyone watching has ever seen photographs of Shard, it's a very good likeness. Um, he was a painter that was affiliated with Dadaism, but also the new objectivity movement in Germany in the 20s, which was really such a hotbed of extraordinary 
kind of collision of ideas, uh, culture, processes. Sure. Um, I, I also, th it, you know, it's interesting, the 1920s, both of these second paintings are, are from the late 20s. Um, I think a lot of people uh, who look back don't quite remember how avant-garde, but yeah, avant-garde, a lot of the art in the 20s was. And you could almost see how some of it led to such reactionary political stuff against mm -hmm. art for that reason. You know, that art was, I mean, I, I, I think it's fine, but like that you could imagine somebody saying, this art is getting too crazy and too risque and too odd. And we need to, we need to, you know, rein it in a little bit. Um, and this is just an interesting experience, you know. I mean, you'd not an seen this interesting example, either. rather. Say again. You'd not seen this painting before either, had you? I had not, and it's 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 interesting to me, both because the person sitting behind him, obviously, a woman with breasts, but like I feel like her face is also kind of weirdly androgynous, in some ways. But it's very much of its time. <laughs> Yeah, with the haircut and the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, there's an amazing photograph by August Sander, actually, and it's something like a telephone operator. Yep, I know the photo. Uh, you know the photograph? I mean, yeah. I, it's very, very similar in so many ways, but it's of its era, isn't it? The thing that, I, you know, this painting is full of um, symbolism. I find it quite bizarre sometimes that simply because of the, the technical way of painting, uh, that Shah does fit with kind of new objectivity because actually he's a symbolist. He really is a symbolist. You know, he's, he is giving scrutiny to the detail of the physical. He is paying homage to things that are actual. But in another way, he's giving uh, a voice an image to something that is beneath the surface. And that really pertains to the, to the title, Thinly Veiled. I mean, this painting is loaded with so much. And actually, though this is in many ways a much more obvious painting, you know, the thinly veiled aspect of this is that this woman painted so beautifully and yet so brazenly, let's face it, yeah. this is a document, a testament to the love of this woman by a man who is betrothed to someone else. And so I do wonder if my title really, the subtext of the title is about forbidden love. Huh, okay. I hadn't thought of the forbidden love thing, but I guess, no, you're right in this case. I hadn't thought about that connection. I also think it's interesting. Do you, I mean, in the original painting is the backdrop look like it has wrinkles in it, like it does in this yes. photo of it? So there are different veils that we might think about in this. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's almost like it looks like a backdrop of the city, like they're on a roof. But obviously that itself is a painted thing that is who knows where they actually are. Right. It's, I mean, there's this whole other layer. Be, it's meant to be the backdrop of the city. And there is a veil that separates them from all. That. Oh, I see. Got it. I understand. Um, and actually, you'll notice probably in terms of the density of the, the image, I did uh, turn the brightness up just a little bit on this so we could see it actually because it's very okay. important that we notice it I think so Shard would have painted that quite deliberately obviously but it yep. has so much meaning um you know we've got the the narcissist it sort of leans in towards him that is a, a symbol well-known symbol of vanity um I mean Shard came from quite a sort of privileged background his father supported him pretty much half his adult life at least until actually a couple of years after this 1929 wall street crash meant that his dad could no longer bankroll him all the time uh so I and mean, he he led quite a pampered life perhaps um and there are lots of other things about him that make him if not unsavory then maybe quite contentious uh he was left leaning in his own sort of polit politics, but he was also endorsed and accepted uh, by the Nazi party later. And he featured in their exhibition of great German art. 
Interesting. Yeah. So uh, I mean, did, did his style change? No, I mean his contemporaries were featured in degenerate art. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. That's that's odd. Mm. Yeah. And I find it odd as well. And many things that are quite bizarre about Shard. Um, I think the painting is most bizarre. It's extraordinarily unsettling. The scar on the woman's face. Yeah. Um, I can't remember how to say it. It's a it's a it's a Neapolitan criminal scar that they would inflict as a punishment on their enemies. It's a very particular kind of scar. So that had meaning at the time that it might not, more meaning at the time than it does now. Yes. Um, you have the black ribbon tied at her wrist. Yep. And you have this thin veil cloaking it, revealing his nakedness. Yep. Tied at his front. Now, when one looks at this painting up close, as I could and did for a very long time at Tate Modern, there's also even a sense that at his chest, where the join of this gossamer garment kind of comes together, is an element almost of it being kind of vaginal or a, an opening into something else that's about a yeah, it, it's almost like a portal space or something that yields. It's a very unsettling thing to look at it. It's also, I, I always look at paintings like this and I think, would it work without the flower? Mm, it'd be a different painting without the flower. I was, I was like, whenever there's like an odd compositional element to something, mm. I always try removing it just to see what it would be like. What do you think of this? Yeah, it's, though? I mean, would you, would you spend time with this painting? No. I was surprised at myself, but nonetheless, I was compelled to look and look and, at And the top garter of a stocking. Yep. And which is the only like sort of red, real red thing in there. I want yeah, to it's 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 an odd painting. But thinly veiled speaks to me again a disguise of a disguise. You know, something it almost hidden away. Go ahead. No, just the secret nature. I felt like if I stayed with it for long enough, it would reveal itself to me eventually. And it didn't. I still found it, it most impenetrable. It almost feels to me. Like the like the, the the painting of the woman and the flower and the veil and the city and the bed could all be a painting unto themselves. And then he just sat himself in front of it. Yeah. Like that he's not in the scene, like he's actually sitting in front of a painting. Mm -hmm. It's a painting of him sitting in front of a painting. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Um it doesn't feel like the two of them are in the same world to me. Mm, I agree. Yet they are. And I wonder about their relationship, those two characters. Well, we wait, do we know that they're in the same world? We don't know that, do we? No, but I, I wonder with self-portrait as the title, you know, it didn't say untitled. It's very definite. But it doesn't say self-portrait of me and this other woman. No, so I wonder in, in, in it if it's even almost like alter ego or... What, what is the purpose of her being there? Now, there's, it, um, I haven't watched- Could be like one step away from Velasquez putting himself in his own paintings, you know? Uh, yes, maybe. Um, there is a really good kind of deconstruction of this painting somewhere else on YouTube, and I haven't watched it, and I wish I had. But at the same time, I was almost filled with a kind of trepidation about seeing someone else's interpretation of it. Yeah, no, 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 we can watch that after we- Make stuff up. <laughs> no, no, let's qualify that. We're not making stuff up. We are inquiring and we're working, sure. we're working with what we have. And actually, again, if I imagine this as I encountered it in a gallery setting, I had a tiny bit of blurb written by somebody in the bowels of Tate um, 
but I didn't have very much else to go on. And so what I met with is, is the truth of it. Yes. Isn't it interesting though, how much, how much weight we put on curators at museums who write these labels? But this is exactly my point actually, Bill, is that we put so much weight on the importance of information given to us by other people. Yeah. And actually the truth of the thing is that I encounter a painting and I see it for what it is relative to me. Mm -hmm. And if I don't have any information, I mean, I have my notebook, as you know, and I fill it up with facts. But that information is, again, I use this term, you know, that information is acquisitional. I have acquired it. I don't really know it. Yeah. What do I really know through looking? That's the thing that interests me the most. What do I really know at looking? And it's not just that. Do you... That. Finish your thing, sorry. Well, it's not just a heightened sense of kind of navel gazing and being self indulged or self indulgent. It really is genuinely also about being with oneself and encountering something else created by someone else. And through that, somehow understanding a wholeness, not just about myself, but seeing all of it as, as being about, about, the world about everyone somehow but do, do you do you ever come to a conclusion about a work of art and then you later find out other facts that change or discount what it is that you were thinking i think facts must stand as facts and if a fact changes perception, then that's just the matter of course. Yeah. But I think what we're talking about, which is really kind of analysis and even better inquiry, even if a fact came along <laughs> that discredited that the scar on her face wasn't in fact the kind of scar that Neapolitan criminals gave each other as punishment. If a fact came along and said, well, actually, no, it was a different kind of scar. It's not even meant to be a scar at all or something. Nonetheless, yeah. I've engaged with it at that level. And so it's breathed life into it. And perhaps I expect that an artist would rather I breathe life or have life from looking than simply navigate it through dead things the dead thing of information the dead thing of information wow heavy thought yeah it's interesting i i mean i would tend to want to collect as many facts as i could and then fill in the spaces with educated guesses of my own design bill you and i most weeks gather here and we have a loose collection of facts mm -hmm. and very often unless you're frantically googling on your phone as we're talking i never google on my phone you're taking what i'm saying yes as a fact now i could be feeding you a load of old baloney couldn't i yeah but absolutely nonetheless it still creates the kind of fertile soil for something dialogue for yes well for us to talk about but also simply for you to access what you see and even if i didn't tell you anything there was no anecdote about standing in tape modern looking there were no facts about christian shard and the nazis there were no dates even we would still look at this and be able to talk about it sure When did, do you know when he died? Uh, 67, maybe? Mm, no, 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 82. He died in 1982. He was quite old when he wow. died. Wow. Could you imagine? This guy is sitting here in 1927 painting this painting with him and some woman or painting himself in front of a painting of some woman or whatever it is that's going on here. And then he saw people land on the moon <laughs> and he saw, you know what I mean, disco. He did this and then he saw Saturday Night Fever. Yeah. 
I did write that down. He was born in 1894. So if he died in 1982, what would he have been? Uh, 88 years old. Okay, so he lived to be an old man. And yes, mm-hmm. he's been a whole host of stuff. Um, I mean, he, he was lauded by critics. He was loved by critics. Um, but he did sort of fall into obscurity a bit after the Wall Street crash. Again, this, this fact that his dad <laughs> bankrolled him. Yeah, when, he, when he stopped having all daddy's money to be able to sit around making art. <laughs> oh, the luxury. Yeah. Anyway, this is the painting you know, and I think most people know. It's such a famous image, really. Such a creepy image. It is a creepy image. It's one of four that he painted, all in 1928. Um, Where was this one in particular? Where? Yeah. What do you mean in the series? No. uh, Do you know where it is now? Oh. No, I don't actually. I like, I just like knowing where things actually are so I could potentially go see them at some point. Hmm. This is the one of the four that is, in many ways, I guess, considered to be the most successful. Number one is the two heads, the same figure forms, but sort of not not kissing. And three and four are hardly known at all. uh, And they don't have any fabric covering the heads, but the heads are disconnected from any sort of bodies. And the other two, they're in private collections, so they're not known. They're very creepy. I mean, this one in popular culture, this is, you know, this crops up in lots of different places. This was used a lot during the pandemic when we were all wearing masks, you know, the kind of prescient image of our time. All right, what what do you think this is trying to say? I mean, you probably know more about this, the history about this painting than I do, but in, in, in in your brain minus the facts, what does this say to you? I think it's about the fact that, um, it's questioning whether we can actually ever really know each other. Yeah. We, we, we go in even to intimate physical contact with walls up. Mm. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's lots of stuff also that we could say. And yes, this is fact stuff that I know about Magritte. I mean, Magritte had pretty miserable childhood. His mum committed suicide at when he was 13. And I mean, there's like a legend that's put up about it where, um, I mean, she tried to take her own life several times throughout his uh, childhood. Sorry, I'm just plugging myself in because I realized my battery's gonna run out. Um, and eventually she drowned herself in the river near where they lived in Belgium. And they didn't find her for a couple of days. And apparently, again, this is legend and it has been discredited by some researchers, but legend had it that Magritte had been present when they did eventually find her body and pull her out of the water. And that when they did pull her out, her skirts had come up and had come around her face and she was shrouded and that image had stayed with him. And so lots of people think that this is a motif comes up you know, kind of in a psychoanalytical way, we could say that it's because there's an acceptance and a denial of truth. You said that this has been discredited later. Well, you know, where do these stories come from? Sometimes that seems like that seems like a very useful story. Useful, like yes, sure. but I don't, I don't know if it's true. But it is. It yeah. was sort of well documented. People would would say that actually about his Isn't it interesting though that looking at the last image, this one is so, the the frame with the red and the blue and the white, um, just fields there looking like a pillar and a ceiling and a sky outside or whatever you want to make it think it is, um, is so much more disembodied than, uh, it's so much more minimal and sort of separated from reality. It's in a dream world, even more so than the last. Well, this I feels mean, like this feels like a weird dissociative dream to me. Yeah, I mean, Magritte's painting is dreamlike. Yeah. You know, as a surrealist, 
Uh, I mean, let's call him what he what he is in context of art history terms. He's a surrealist. We look at somebody who's a, a very uh, fine representational painter, but the representations are of things that don't belong with each other. Yep. And that disconnect is the thing that obviously gives rise to the surrealism, but also this beautiful dreamlike quality. I'm saying beautiful, yet also disconcerting, discombobulating. Um, I think there are lots of things about Magritte. You know, he struggled actually as a, as a young artist, his first, what he would think of as like surrealist painting in his first exhibition, you know, the critics laughed him off the wall. They hated it. They thought it was just insane and rubbish. They had a sort of advertising background um, and he returned to that periodically. And in the inter uh, post-war years, after the Second World War, he actually made his money <laughs> making fakes of um, Brock and de huh. Um And then with his brother, all that fakery stood them in good stead to paint fake money. Huh. It became, uh, that's terrible. Until then they kind of came into a slightly more um, stable financial period. And he went back yeah. to painting his, his kind of surrealist work. You know, you think about these, these artists and, and we come at them and we might see them just through one painting. And there are all these, the, the life behind the painting is, is so interesting. Yeah, and, and we also assume that their careers were very linear when a lot of times they were all over the place, whether, whether they had the money, whether wars were happening, whether you know, people thought that their work was good, whether it showed up in the way, whether the art world shifted to a whole new way of thinking and they were left behind or they were ahead of the times or they fell in love or they were depressed or the, you know what I mean? Like whatever, or they were young or they were old when they made it. It's like, all of those details really change the way you look at a piece of art a lot of times. Mm. Uh, at least they do for me. Um, but yeah, you could you could pull out four or five Magritte paintings and say, okay, here's a set of Magritte and that's why he's a big deal. But there's so much more to it. Yeah, I mean, his... Um... <laughs> the things that he loved again, that might shed some light on this. Apparently he was obsessed with Fantomas, which was a fictional character who appeared in kind of pulpy comic style publication novels and yeah. um, in sort of films that had been made. He, he loved that character and that character was like always in the shadows and wore like a mask of loose fabric around his face. So, you know, the story of the mother being pulled from the from the river is of course poignant. And if that's true, yes, we could say that's profoundly impactful, but there could also be something quite as simple as- Could also just be a cartoon that he liked. He, he loved this character from <laughs> yeah. this kind of quite bizarre um, series of, of novels and, and little films. Yeah. Um, I think with, with Magritte though, uh, I mean, I'm going to read it. He believed it does not mean anything because mystery means nothing. Um, it's unknowable. So that's paraphrasing him a little bit, but he did want us to ask. Wait, doesn't mean anything because mystery means nothing? Well, he wanted us to ask, what does it mean? That's what he's encouraging. He's asking us to ask. But then in asking, I don't know if it's playful or just a bit perverse, that he wants then to say, well, even the mystery of it is meaningless. It means nothing. It yeah, seems like to, you to, go along a, a bit with him and then you get a slap in the face from him. Right. And that, that to me, if if you really believe that, then why the hell did you paint it in the first place? You know what I mean? That's like that, that's where I go. Obviously, you don't actually believe that, and you're just saying that to sound cool. <laughs> you disagree? Don't know. I just I do like a person with a bit of edge, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, 
anyway, I think back to this idea of, of the title, Thinly Veiled. This um, one is far more veiled than the first two. Well. Although at least we know the action that they're doing, we just don't see their faces. Where the other ones are less veiled physically, but more veiled intentionally. Do all of them share intimacy? The first one only because I know the story behind it. Okay. In looking though, I mean, this is like trying to adjust our perception when we look at any portrait and we say, well, has the artist, what is the artist's relationship really to this model, this sitter? You know, in looking at this painting, could I deduce that this woman was loved? And I mean, because I'm an absolute hopeless romantic, of course, when I see this woman, I believe that she's been loved by the painter. I think that's only because you know. I don't know, I mean, Flaubert, <laughs> what did he write about her? Gustave Flaubert wrote about her and he said okay. something like, she's a beautiful woman and that's all you need to know. You know, so in kind of like the annals of history and the references to her throughout history, you know, it's, it's just so well understood. Um, and maybe it's diminishing for her, belittling in her in some way, just to say, well, because she's so beautiful, of course, beautiful, of course she is loved. But, you know, we know that's not the case, don't we? Not everything or everybody who is beautiful is profoundly loved. But I maybe do feel that there's, as I said earlier, tenderness. And yes, Raphael, for me, paints in a very gentle way. It's very, very um, special, that refinement, softness, somehow that essence in Raphael's painting is far superior actually to most of his contemporaries, in my opinion, even Michelangelo. And so I believe her to be loved. Yeah, I, just side sidebar, I think Michelangelo's sculptures are far more refined than his paintings but I'll just put that aside for the moment. Uh, his whatever, four paintings that exist or whatever. Um, but I will say that if you and I went to the National Gallery, if I flew over there, you and I meet up in London, we go to the National Gallery and we look at a bunch of paintings of, of people and I say, all right, without looking at anything, without knowing anything, is this person in love with the person who's painting them? Is there some relationship going on? And I pulled all the way around the place and we actually did the research. My guess is that you'd come out 50-50. What's your point, Bill? My point is that, you know, I like the idea that you like to put that story on there, but I think that that story is, 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 is. Exactly that, a story. Yes, but it, but it, but it, but it, but it is, it, it is playing to your desires in the yeah. sense that like you, you want there to be a story behind the painting, whether or not there is. You know. well, then, then I could also see this as this was the young wife of some woman that he, you know, some guy he had to, you know, got paid, he got hired to go paint this woman, this guy's wife, and this is the painting that resulted. And he actually didn't like her at all, because he was gay, or whatever it is. Like, I could totally buy that story just as much based entirely on looking at the painting. You might be right. I, but maybe I'm just insensitive to these kinds of things. I think what you're saying, though, is like a, a, a prompt point, like a springboard for us to talk, not today, but another time, really, uh, about what any art is. Yeah. In, in, in that, uh, that I put my story there, you know, what, what actually does the artist want? Does the artist seek to make something that lies like an empty vessel? Or does the artist want to make something that stands there as a statement? And then the statement is given. You know, a statement in painting can be very oblique. Sure. I mean, that, that could be true in any, I mean, listen, you know, you can take a Gregory Crudson photograph and you see the person in a Gregory Crudson photograph and you think, 
what is that person thinking? And in reality on the set, he always says to the people is give me less, show me less, <laughs> say less. And it's like, well, then what is it that you're trying to capture? You're trying to capture nothing so that there really is just a hole for the viewer to put themselves into, which I guess is a, I guess it's valid. I would almost rather someone have the subject of a portrait in this case actually try to say something, but that also might be my own bias based upon what I try to do with my own work. I can't imagine that it's different when you are a painter because you have so much more time. You know, you have so much more control. Yeah. Well, who knows where we've gone. Next week, are we going to have to discuss exactly what you just described? Let's do it. Let's go no holds barred. 10 rounds. <laughs> on the intentionality of an artist well yes and it's a very important question i think we could look at in fact i think we're gonna have dueling quotes by artists saying whether or not they think that their stuff has intention that way they thunk Did you <laughs> <laughs> well phil thank you thank you sandy as always <laughs>